grades on the people that come. <coughs> so, all right, here we are ready for the second half. Uh, this part of our lecture begins with goal setting. Uh, there are some interesting things about goal setting. I can't remember uh, if we've addressed this subject with children with disabilities or not, but certainly if we have, we're going to take a little different perspective on it right now. We're going to talk about uh, goal setting as a strategy for enhancing a student's motivation. <clears throat> Oftentimes, one of the ways that we can involve kids in school is letting them participate in the selection of their curriculum, rule setting, and other things we've talked about, but also setting and monitoring goals for themselves. If they see that the objective is for them to master this amount, and then they attempt to master this amount, and they monitor progress toward the goal, it's a great feeling of accomplishment and success when they finally get to the point they want to be at when they uh, achieve the objective that has been set for them. And this sort of goal setting often happens uh, uh, in, in children uh, normally. They set objectives for themselves and we all do. Uh, I know you may have said, well, I'm going to read this chapter and then I'm going to take a break and go get me something to eat and I'm going to master this amount, memorize this many, and then I'm going to go to the movies or whatever. So we often set goals for ourselves of all kinds, financial goals, uh, achievement goals, uh, career objectives and so on and so forth. But ch students with disabilities, particularly those, any low achiever who's not motivated, often can benefit from a system and a structure in the classroom that helps them to set and monitor goals. And so teachers can be mindful of strategies for doing this, but one of the things that you need to be careful for is, is how you involve children in setting their own goals. You may not know it, but the truth is when kids with who are low achievers are asked to establish goals for themselves, like if you say to a child, you know, uh, we need to work on math this week, you know, how many pages do you think you can do? The student is liable to respond in one of two ways. He's liable to say, 125 pages. Well, this may be a child who isn't going to master 125 pages in six weeks, much less this week. On the other hand, the student is just as likely to say, two. So when we ask children who are low achievers to participate in goal setting, we find that they don't set very realistic goals for themselves. What we want kids to do is set challenge level goals. Gosh, you know, I think I can do about two pages a day. So you can negotiate with the child when you're involving that student in goal setting. Let's see, now do you think you'll be able to do two pages? this week. Okay, well he can. Well, can you make a commitment to two pages? Okay, he can. So that is a system that we might use in uh, setting and maintaining goals with children. Put some structure around there and let them, when they finish uh, the certain number of problems or get certain number of spelling words right, let them monitor their progress toward those goals. And teachers can develop self-monitoring charts to help or let the students develop a chart of, of their own. The students can promote uh, effort by making a contract with the students that says after you do this amount, these kinds of things will happen. We'll have this sort of outcome or consequential event or reward or party or whatever. You can communicate with the, parent, uh, the child's parents about the goals you're working on and even have folders that you take home at the end of the week that show the goals that the student has mastered. All of these things are helpful in uh, <coughs> 
motivating children to take on increasingly uh, more demanding aspects of the curriculum and maintaining effort on these tasks until they are successful. Another thing closely related to goal setting is training positive attributions. We talked about attributions a little bit earlier in classroom management, I believe, but in any event, we know that uh, children who are low achievers don't necessarily attribute success in failure to appropriate causes. They tend to think when when they succeed, it's because they're lucky. They tend to think that when they fail, it's because they don't know why, the teacher didn't like them. On the other hand, children who are high achievers are very aware of the relationship between studying and efforting and studying the right things and mastering the objectives and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we want to uh, do is is to help children who are low achievers understand the relationship between trying really hard and achieving the objective that they have set out to master. It is very possible that children who are low achievers develop negative attributions because that's what they learned. They may have learned in the past that working really hard or efforting did not result in success. I mean, <clears throat> you couldn't expect them to acquire the information that everything results in success when in their past they've efforted and efforted and efforted and it never did them any good. So maybe, or if it, sometimes it did do good and sometimes it didn't do good and they may not have had a school history that has, has convinced them uh, about appropriate positive attributions. So positive attributions about success will remind students that they can succeed on future tasks and it will give them information about how to interpret their failures and what kinds of behavior they need to engage in to successfully complete tasks. They learn to attribute success to their own efforts and academic strategies rather than random events that they have no control over. Another thing is that teachers need to reinforce positive efforts. You, uh, you need to be a little bit careful about this, though, because um, we'll, we'll talk a little earlier about uh, rewarding effort and then rewarding kids for things they're doing already. but. One of the things that happens when students effort and fail is that they develop learned helplessness about academic tasks. Some of you have probably, if you've been in schools, have noticed the child who gets a piece of paper, teacher hands out an assignment, the child never looks at it, he raises his hand and says, teacher, I can't do this. Teacher, I need help. I don't know how to do this. We refer to that as learned helplessness. And this syndrome of underachievement or school failure results in kids who make negative attributions, who learn that uh, have difficulty setting appropriate goals, and learn that their response to academic tasks is, I can't do it. This is the, to the total reverse of task commitment. This is a child who has no commitment to task. The minute he sees the task, he assumes that he will not be able to do this without help from the teacher, and so he gives up before he even tries. And of course, this once again creates the impression in his mind that he cannot do this task. So eventually, he believes that he can't do it, whether he has looked at it or not. Um, Sometimes your book recommends uh, counseling interventions, uh, such as group counseling for children who are having difficulties of one kind or another. Certainly, uh, you could uh, work in your school to arrange some sort of counseling intervention for youngsters who are low achievers. We know that uh, group counseling techniques have been very, very effective for children, for example, who are going through a divorce, who are dealing with substance abuse issues, who may be dealing with weight uh, issues, eating disorders of one sort or another. So peer groups are very, very uh, powerful 
in changing and supporting student behavior of all kinds and this might be a strategy you would want to try in your school for underachievement as well. There are uh, numerous counseling research studies that have been conducted with students with disabilities and have yielded quite positive findings about, the measure, about how measures of increased relaxation, decreased truancy, increased self-esteem, self-concept and general well-being, all of these outcomes have been well documented as the result of counseling techniques in the schools. If you, it's important though for you to note, if you encounter a student with serious affective problems like depression or anxiety, you think the child may be exhibiting suicidal tendencies, uh, that you uh, contact the parents and you obtain outside professional help. One of the things that you can never do is uh, agree uh, to, to child. For example, if you have children journal in your room, as particularly teachers, is anybody going to be English language arts in here interested in that? Uh, uh, reading English language arts type teachers oftentimes um, have students journal for the first 10 minutes of every day. There are lots of good things that come out of journaling, a academic as well as affective objectives that come from this. But you may have a child, and I, this actually happened to me one time with a graduate intern. She was at uh, Spring Shadows Glen Hospital as a uh, teacher of, of emotionally disturbed children, and she had a child journal suicidal ideologies in his journal. And of course, she, she had told the students you know, that their journals were private and their information in them would not be shared with anybody. But if you have a child who uh, expresses suicidal ideologies, you certainly have to seek professional help beyond the realm of the teaching profession because we're really not equipped to handle those kinds of things and there can be damning consequences to children who threaten suicide. So while we want to maintain certainly a sense of pri privacy and trust with youngsters, there are uh, points at which we have to go for outside help of some other kind. Uh, we've talked a little bit around and about about variety of ways for increasing students' personal investments in the classroom, but we know they feel more involved if they uh, participate in decision-making about the rules and procedures. We talked about one strategy a minute ago for for involving their them in, in goal setting. Uh, you may allow them to choose the seating arrangement or who they're going to work with in groups if they can do so and maintain positive social behavior. Uh, also, it's important that students feel they are able to express themselves <coughs> anonymously if you want to get feedback about how to structure the classroom or what to change. Their evaluations can be submitted to you in a questionnaire form so that they don't necessarily feel they have to increase their vulnerability. That isn't something I personally mind doing. I, I'm happy to provide feedback or uh, evaluations of any kind uh, and sign my name to them. Usually what I have to say I think is very positive and very constructive and if I think something is wrong I try to, to make a suggestion for a way that system could be changed. So I personally don't mind, feel a need for anonymity but some people do and they even people who are well-meaning and well-intentioned just somehow feel too vulnerable if they have to identify themselves as part of the feedback process. So it may be important for you even in your classroom with children to allow them to give uh, feedback. Also kids in school are not used to being asked what they think and what their suggestions are. So they may have to learn to be comfortable with this sort of a model. I don't think there's any uh, degree to which you can make learning too uh, much fun or too enjoyable, not only for you, but also for the students in your classroom. As long as you are making progress toward the uh, uh, essential knowledge and skills curriculum that you're required to teach, the more fun it is, I think the better the students will like it. And many of these things that we have a passion about that make learning so much fun, uh, uh, kids will remember far beyond the point at which they remember um, 
writing uh, the uh, letters of the alphabet or learning to write cursive writing or learning to do long division or whatever. And there are so many teachers who have motivated children in so many ways that you'd never anticipate because they had the enthusiasm uh, about a particular topic. I can't remember, did I tell you all in here about the teacher uh, that I knew once who did the rainforest every year? She had an integrated unit in the rainforest. These kinds of things can make basic skills lots and lots of fun. And that's an experience those students will never forget. They may not remember learning uh, the, uh, any uh, element of the ecosystem. They'll just know that they know it and remember doing the rainforest. So making our lessons concrete and meaningful and fun, providing lots of examples and exemplars making sure they're relevant to their personal lives. All of these things uh, are important and make the lessons seem more fun and more enjoyable. Another uh, thing, a technique is called creating co cognitive uh, conflict. This sort of disconnect that says, why do you think this is this way? can stimulate children to be curious and do problem solving to discover what do you think you could make out of this? Then children begin to engage in those sort of um, analytic reasoning skills that result in their answering questions. In any event, cognitive conflict refers to situations that are really not easily explainable or predictable in outcome in the beginning. And they're created when kids see these discrepant events or where the things they're looking at behave differently than they thought. For example, you might uh, walk over to the light switch and flip it and it doesn't turn the light switch off. Well, that's an, uh, uh, a cognitive uh, conflict because when we turn the switch, we expect it to go off. So you could start your lesson. The antecedent event might be, be this discrepant event and the lesson might be having the student understand how a light switch wa works in operating electricity. Uh, anything that is novel and different and unusual can be served as a hook to get kids in. One of the reasons I love our lesson plan format that I use in here is because it requires you to establish an anticipatory set and get the kids' attention in a meaningful way. Certainly, we've uh, talked a lot about competitive and game-like activities uh, that make use of cooperative learning. Our uh, lesson for today, our guided practice for today, uh, is going to uh, involve the motivational aspects of applying uh, uh, cooperative learning to motivation. Uh, there is a word of caution about this, though. Make certain that you don't try too hard. Uh, you know, sometimes I think teachers just really get kind of caught up in psychobabble and uh, this sort of thing that's contrived. And when you do and motivation is concerned, it may seem contrived and artificial and have the negative effect that you want. But uh, Certainly enthusiasm on your part is an important element. Uh, another thing I'd like to talk about for a little bit is praise. I think we are so quick to punish students in school and it's so important to praise students for their efforts and structure rewards for the outcomes that you want to see. But one thing you need to watch for is the overjustification effect and this is real important. Uh, and I'll give an example of how overjustification occurred with my own children in just a minute. But overjustification occurs when the interest and the performance in an activity is already high. The kids already are doing this thing, or many of them are already doing it. They're already doing what you want them to do. They're already interested in it. They're already successful at it. But suddenly you decide to reward them for it. Well. When you reward students for tasks, you know, particularly with tangible reinforcers, for tasks that they already willingly engage in, a strange thing happens. Their performance tends to deteriorate. And I'll give you an example of when this happened with my own children. It was amazing.
I, I used to think all ch you, everybody who only has one child, I think, thinks that that first child is what kids are. The truth is, God gives you a second child, and you realize you knew nothing about. You have children. Well, let me tell you, when you have your next one, that one will be nothing like the one you have now. It's just a trick God plays on parents. I mean, you think you have it down, and so it gives you something entirely different the next time. But anyway, I had these two little children. They were going to this she she. Uh, Day, nursery school thing so I could work and uh, I was very uh, very uh, uh, elaborate the children's greenhouse now doesn't that just sound wonderful for a nursery school but anyway they were going to the children's greenhouse and I guess you know my younger child this one that disassembled the car and put all the body parts in it I mean this kid would sleep 24-7. Now, if there was ever child, you just put him down and zonk, he was out. My other child would not go to bed. My first child would not go to bed. He would ride a tricycle till he was just frozen, you know, in sleep on his tricycle. And you'd have to pick him up and put him in bed. But anyway, these two children were at the school. And I guess, along with Lamar, some of the other children in there were not sleeping either. And so their teachers decided that they were going to reinforce sleeping at nap time. And so they decided there were so many problems with this little plan that they had, but one of them was they decided they were going to give dinosaurs uh, to the children who took a nap every day. Well, the first problem with that is little girls, most of the little girls I know aren't too into dinosaurs, and so... You know, right there, I, I question, you know, given the same reinforcer to all the little four-year-olds, you're probably going to have trouble finding one thing that everybody wants to work for. But anyway, this program completely discounted the fact that some of the kids were already taking naps. They laid down when they were supposed to and took the nap. And Pike was one such child. I mean, they said nap time and splat. He hit that mat, covered up in his little blankie, and he was gone. He was out of there. So the first week, he got his dinosaur. Well, Lamar, of course, he didn't get one because he wouldn't take a nap. But Lamar wanted that dinosaur so bad. The next week, Pike decided it would be more fun to keep Lamar awake. So his, he never got another dinosaur. Now, Lamar started taking naps so he could get that dinosaur because he wanted it really bad, and it was worth taking a nap for him. But Pike said, oh, well, now that I've figured out this is what they want me to do, I'm not going to do that anymore. Of course, there were lots of problems with that program, too, and I'm going to make you think of this one. Why is it? that a program that says everybody who takes a nap this week gets a dinosaur on Friday is doomed to failure. You have to think about this. You have to figure it out because if you don't, you'll never be successful at behavior, a behavior management program. Why is it that a program that says every child who takes a nap every day this week gets a dinosaur on Friday? Why is that doomed to failure? Our TV camera guy knows. <laughs> he was probably that type of student too. Why doesn't that work? It's going to excite the students that you know want the dinosaur, therefore not able to go to sleep. <laughs> well, that could be. What if he? What if they? miss their nap on Monday. Mm. Do I try anymore? If you missed your nap on Monday, you blew the turn. So you might as well be sure that nobody sleeps on Tuesday. You might as well keep everybody awake on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday because you hadn't got another chance till next week. Right? Are kids that deviant? 
You bet. <laughs> if they're smart enough. I'm going to take them all down with me. It, they're right, sure. <laughs> If they're smart enough to know that if they take a nap every day this week and can wait till Friday for that freaking dinosaur, do you think they can't figure out if I don't get one? You know, it's the if mama doesn't sleep, nobody sleeps type thing. Sure, they're that devious. If you're going to have a plan like that and you've decided that five naps is worth one dinosaur, let me ask you, what's sacred about Friday? Whenever they've accumulated five naps, give them a dinosaur. Because every child who misses Monday on that deal has no incentive to take a nap whatsoever until the next Monday. And lots of kids just, that can be good for four days just can't be good for five days in a row. I'll give you another example of a semi that happened to be with little bitty kids. This occurred in a fifth grade classroom. The kids got five cards on Monday. And every time they misbehaved, one of those cards got pulled away. And on Friday, if they had five cards left, they could trade it for something and if they had four cards left they could trade it for something else and if they had three cards left they could trade it for a homework pass and I think if they had less than three well they were just out of luck now there's a reason why I don't know what the reward was for five cards and four cards my kids only got three cards because they wanted a homework pass. <laughs> so they always wasted those first two misbehaviors. <laughs> but I wouldn't have wanted to be that teacher if they had made a mistake and wasted that third one too. Because those other, they might as well go ahead and misbehave all five times worth because they weren't going to get anything or any more chances. There was no way for them to earn any cards for being good. There's a lot of things wrong with those systems like that. First of all, that one derives from punishment. It's, that happens to be called response cost, but that, that plan derives from response cost. If you're bad, it's going to cost you money. If you speed, you're going to get a ticket, so to speak. And uh, if you don't speed twice, nothing good happens to you. You don't get anything else. But when you are bankrupt in a system with response cost, you have no incentive to be good. If that, if that child wanted the thing that in number five, some children might be able to want what was in number five, but they might not ever be able to be good for all the days of the week. So they don't ever have a chance to get what they want. Let them save those things. What, what, what's wrong with a system that says as soon as you get three, what's it wrong with a system that says every time you're good, I'm going to give you a card? And as soon as you get three cards, you can get a homework pass. And if you want to save up to five cards, then you can get whatever that other thing is. Or four cards or six cards and if you can't get five cards by Friday well we'll keep your cards in the bank till next week and you can be good a couple of days next week and work up to your five do you see what I'm saying you have to think about these things very very carefully because you can't reward kids for things they're already doing and you can't it, 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 uh, it is likely to make their behavior deteriorate. If you reward them for turning in their math papers, for example, and they've already been doing their math papers. So think about those kinds of things because you don't want to create the over-justification effect. Uh, 
I do think it is important to distinguish between rewards and bribes and, uh, and set up the conditions that you're going to use in order to uh, uh, make an award and also the performance criteria that are required for obtaining a reward. Uh, they may be different for different students in your classroom. They may involve both tangible and intangible rewards. We've talked about tangible and intangible rewards in here before, but typically tangible rewards are things you can see and touch. They are things like uh, pocket cars or candy or pencils, school supplies or dinosaurs in, the, in this particular case. Intangible rewards tend to be things that are praise or social recognition or maybe creating an honors bulletin board where you are uh, drawing very positive attention to the students who have been successful and so on and so forth. Back when we were talking about over-justification, we talked about not rewarding a child for something that they're already doing. This may mean that you need to negotiate independence per independent performance criteria for different kids in your room. All kids don't need to work on the same thing. Some students might need to work on volunteering answers or talking out or doing something else. You know, we have children sometimes that are very shy, that need really need to practice making social interactions, being the leader, being comfortable in position, in getting attention. So there are lots of, of, of different areas that students need to work in. So rather than negotiate standards based on some the notion that some of the one thing is good for everybody. Negotiate standards based on individual need. What is it that you need to work on? This makes it so much easier then for you to justify the fairness when you need to. When somebody says, how come he gets a dinosaur for taking a nap and I don't? Then you can say, you really didn't need help taking a nap. You, you did a good job of taking a nap already. What we need to work on for you is completing your language arts cards. Are you interested in getting a dinosaur? Oh, good. Then let's, how many language arts cards do you think you could complete this week? Would that, would you like that? That's easy for me. I don't think school has to be the same for everybody. You don't have to do what I say, but what you have to do is decide what you think is fair. But if your only way of exercising fairness is to make all your requirements and all the outcomes the same for everybody, you're going to miss incredible opportunities to meet the individual needs of your students. It's just like saying that if her glasses are good for her, they must be good for everybody. So we're going to make all of you wear her glasses. And they probably wouldn't do anybody else in here any good, right? But you'd be hard pressed to do without them. We, we individualize all the time about things in helping and providing people with what they need to have their individual needs met. And I think it's the same thing with motivation and affect. We give kids what, we need, what they need to make sure they're turned on. And what is good, the dinosaur that was good for making Lamar take a nap was the same dinosaur that made Pike think, ooh, I've already, I'm have i not going to do this anymore. So think about those kinds of things. Right now, I'm going to, we're going to take a break, study break, work break, work session, whatever. I know there's a word for what we're going to do. We're going to do the work session, and Kim's going to do your guided practice.
<laughs> Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. How is everybody? We're good. Good. Uh, today for our guided practice, we are combining Chapter 8 and Chapter 9 together uh, by reviewing and learning and doing an assignment on a cooperative learning strategy. And it happens to be a cooperative learning game that you can do in the classroom. Uh, very motivating. Uh, I know I've talked about my daughter Molly before. She is one of those children that children it is not intrinsically motivated to get A's. My older child, my 16-year-old, yes. My younger daughter, eh, yeah, whatever. Okay. okay, that's just the way we were talking about how different children can be. Total opposite ends of the spectrum, my two girls. So she was one of those that's not intrinsically motivated. If she has a science or a social studies test the next day, don't, we, don't you think we ought to study? Eh, yeah, I guess. You know, she's not motivated to get A's. If I, if I get a B, a C, a 72, that's good. That, that passed, okay? But one day she did come home to me, uh, any fourth grade, this is when she was in fourth grade, Texas history. I am not from Texas. I am from West Virginia, New York, East Coast states. And, uh, when you, and my daughter brings Texas history uh, lessons home. I know nothing about Texas history. So I, am, I learned last year along with her. But she was having a Texas history test in a couple of days. She says, Mom, I've got to study tonight. I said, what? This is, wait a minute, wait, someone has kidnapped my younger daughter and replaced her with another child. You have to study? She said, yeah, because we're going to play splat ball. I said, okay, <laughs> tell me what this is. She says, it's so cool. We line up in teams and the teacher gives us this sponge ball that's kind of wet and we have to throw it at the blackboard and whatever we hit, that's what question we have to answer. And so I went in the next day, I was friends with her teacher and I said, I had to see this. She had the, the board, the blackboard in grids and there was a number in each grid and sure enough, those kids lined up in teams, took that little, it wasn't real wet, kind of damp sponge ball, threw it at the blackboard, and whatever question they hit, that was the question they had to answer about Texas history. And I'm sure she used it for other subjects too, science, math. So this was the motivating factor to get my daughter to study for her Texas history test. She got an A. You know what? She was really proud of herself. So I begged, can you play splat ball every time we're going to have a test, please? I don't know if she did or not, but this was very motivating for my daughter. The A on the test isn't what motivated her. It was the game. It was answering questions correctly in front of her peers. It was having her team win. And I'm not even sure she even knew what you know, they would get when they won. I think it was extra recess or homework pass or something. But it was the game itself and interacting with her peers and knowing the answers so her team would win that motivated her to study for that Texas history test. We are going to do a strategy and learn about a strategy today that is uh, like that. It's a cooperative learning strategy. It's called the Numbered Heads Together Strategy. When you're doing cooperative learning games in your classroom uh, for any activity, planning for any activity, uh, it's not just playing a game. You have to really plan and think through every step of the game or the activity, what you're going to do, because there are, there are important factors you have to think about with everything involved in that game. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. The Number It Heads Together strategy makes drills and quick reviews of facts entertaining, as any classroom game should. It adds depth to students' participation in a more complex academic work. Every child is a contributor when you play this game, and that's what cooperative learning is all about. Every child gets to be a contributor. Just like when my daughter played splat ball, she knew she would get her turn to contribute with her team to play that and answer questions for her team. Um, it's an excellent cooperative learning strategy for all students. This is uh, especially good when you have students with disabilities in your classroom. This gives them a chance to be part of what's going on, to contribute, and to actually answer questions and uh, contribute to their team's score. And you'll see how that works in just a minute. How does it work? Well, the students are put into learning groups. Uh, a lot of times when you have elementary school students or intermediate school students, you might have learning groups already established in your classroom. 
you might say, okay, get into your learning groups. We're going to do an activity. And those students already know what their learning groups are. You have to give some thought as to how you're going to form these learning groups. How are you going to include those students socially? What's going to be a good group, way to group your students? What about the students with disabilities or the students who are slow learners? What group should they be in? How are you going to make it fair? How are you going to make the groups fair? Because you'll hear about it, believe me, if it's not fair. Those kids will tell you. So you have to give some thought as to how are you going to group those students to really make it an effective strategy. After you group your students, the students receive a number. I'm, I'm going to give you the bare bones of this strategy today because on your assignment, I want you to be creative with it. I want you to tell me this would be a creative way to group the students. This would be a creative and fun way to assign numbers. Today, I'm just giving you envelopes with numbers. But you may think of a better creative way to do that. The teacher poses a question. And whatever subject you're reviewing, it might be a test the next day, some kind of assessment, uh, you might just want to check their understanding. Is my class getting this material? The students in each group make sure everybody knows the answer. This is where the cooperative group, cooperative learning comes in. Okay, everyone, that's why it's called heads together. They put their heads together, okay, and they agree on an answer. The whole group agrees on an answer. Okay, uh, uh, you know, some of the students may know the answer, some may not, but in the end, everyone in that group will have the same answer. And then the teacher calls on a number to answer the question. So uh, groups in here, I might say, okay, number twos, stand up, okay? And then I'll, I'll think of a way to, to choose which student to answer the question from that group. <coughs> Now, this is where you can get creative with the way you play the game, the cooperative learning game. Uh, vary the way the students provide answers. Now, I don't want to give you, I want you to get creative on your assignments. I'll give you a few examples. Of course, there's always the old fashioned way you just say the answer, right? Uh, maybe they could all race to the blackboard and write the answer down. Maybe they could have cards that they hold up each team with the answer they received. That way, everybody could get a point instead of just one team getting a point. Oh, you got the right answer, you got the right answer, you got the right answer. So the, you can vary the way that the, <clears throat> the groups give their answers. Vary your scorekeeping procedures. What would be a good and creative way to keep score? And a fair way, too. <clears throat> vary ways to determine the winning team and vary your rewards. Uh, maybe everybody wins. Maybe one team wins. What is the reward? Maybe one team has to serve the other team snack that day, whatever it may be. And you can also get creative with using familiar game show formats. How many of you have ever in school or had a teacher play Jeopardy in your classroom? Very motivating. I always to love playing Jeopardy. I uh, uh, used to play Wheel of Fortune with my kids. Dice games, you know, maybe you could roll the dice and that number has to answer the question. Loads of different ways and creative ways you can uh, use, this, use different activities in different formats. Uh, for this, okay? Um, be careful when you're doing this game or any cooperative learning games to motivate students. Um, make sure teams have equal response opportunities. Like I said, kids will let you know if they don't think it's fair. They'll let you know in a heartbeat, it's not fair. The way you did that, our team didn't get a chance. So these are the things you have to think about. Am I being fair to all the kids? Make sure, students have equal res make sure students have equal response opportunities. And this is a way to do it with the numbers uh, because you're going to call all the numbers. <clears throat> make sure the strategy for assigning groups is fair. And I, I uh, talked about this before. Uh, give this a lot of thought about how you want to group your students in your classroom. And uh, make sure everybody's included and uh, make sure your groups are, are fair and equal and provide adaptations for students with special needs. Um, this might be communication. What if that student is not verbal and it's their turn to give an answer? How is that student going to give an answer so they feel a part of the group and a part of the activity? That may be something you have to figure out. Um, maybe that student needs to have a written list of the questions you're going to ask because auditorily they can't follow or have a hearing impairment. So you have to think of those students with special needs in your classroom to make sure they are involved 
They are collaborating. They are part of the group. Okay. In your assignment for this, uh, I'm going to ask you to find some learning objectives. Okay, because anytime you do this, you have to have objectives in mind. What do I want my students to get out of this activity? This is what I want them to learn. This is what we're working on. This is what the test is on. This is what I um, want to check for understanding on. So make sure you have some types of learning objectives based on those world famous TEKS. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have you identify items that you, you directly related to those objectives. Okay, so if your objective is uh, the Nose Explorers, Texas Explorers, well, I'm going to have you on your assignment tell me some questions about Texas Explorers. What do you want them to know about Texas Explorers? It's the specifics about how you're going to carry out the grouping and all of those things we just talked about. And you will have, um, there's case studies on your assignment of two children who do have disabilities and uh, I'd like some information in your assignment. What adaptations will you make for those students? Because you will have students with disabilities in your classrooms whenever you're trying to do these types of motivating, cooperative learning activities. And how are you going to, what adaptations will you make for those students? And that will be part of your assignment also. Are there any questions? Okay, you ready? <laughs> okay, go ahead and open your envelope, and we're going to try out this game. As I said, this is going to be the bare bones. I'm not going to get real creative with you because I, want you, I don't want to take any of your good ideas that you'll put into your assignment, but I just want to give you an example of how the game is played. Now, we have a group of five over here, so uh, four and five, you can share. <laughs> you can both stand up. Now. My objectives for our cooperative learning motivating game today have to do with, guess what, inclusion of special education children in the regular classroom, just what we've been studying. I went back to your book to some of the more informational factual chapters and I'm going to, my objectives for you today are the students will identify the disability categories served under IDEA. The students will identify adaptations that can be made for students with disabilities in the general education classroom. And the students will identify components of the federal laws protecting the educational services for students with disabilities. You ready to put your heads together? Okay. I'm sorry, the objectives? Um, I can, I, did you want to write them down? No, 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 just say what they are. Is it the laws or whatever? Oh, uh, short, in short, uh, IDEA, adaptations, and federal laws protecting students with disabilities. Okay, the, now, like I said, I didn't want to get too creative because I don't want to steal any of your ideas you might put in your assignment. So we're going to do it just bare bones today. I'm going to give you the question. I want you to put your heads together. Okay, and then I'm going to call out a number, and I'd like that person to grab the microphone since we're using microphones. Okay, and I will call on one of the uh, numbers in that group to answer the question. Okay, are we ready? Okay, what does the acronym IDEA stand for? Oh, I see a lot of shaking heads. Oh no, this is back to chapter one. We're in trouble. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if I should let them use notes. No notes. Oh, no, let them. Oh, really? <laughs> they should know these. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, number fours. Raise your hand. I'm going to pick this group right here. Yes, ma'am. I do. I just want to get over with. Individuals with Disability and Education Act. Close enough. Very good. Okay, one point. I'm going to have you keep your own score. One point for this team. Next question. What is an IEP? Not what it stands for. What is it? Do you have a question? No. Okay. Okay. Put your heads together. You never know what number I'm going to call, so everybody needs to know the answer. Mm 
Number twos, raise your hand. We call this group right here. Microphone. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's a set of attainable goals um, for each individual student. Okay, I'll take that. It's a lot more than that, but that is definitely one of the most important parts of an IEP, individual education plan. Question number three, give yourself a point, by the way. What is, the, what is LRE? What does it stand for? And what is the LRE for students with disabilities? Ooh, that's a tough one, Dr. Goodwin. I don't know. What does LRE stand for, and what is the LRE for students with dis disabilities? <laughs> now, Dr. Goodman said she was going to help you all, but she's not helping. <laughs> okay, number ones, raise your hand. This group over here, Lee. It's uh, the least restrictive environment. And as far as, it's going to vary for each child. I mean, for a child that's capable of, of being in a regular classroom, the least restrictive environment would be for them. But if it's a child that doesn't have the skills, the least restrictive environment might be the special ed classroom. Let me put it this way. In the continuum of services, what is the least restrictive environment? Oh, it's the regular, the regular classroom. The general ed classroom. General ed classroom. Sure. Full time. That's, I thought, I didn't understand it either. I thought, oh. what? Oh, that, that yeah. Which, <laughs> <laughs> Number four, this severe lifelong disability is characterized by impairments in communication, learning, and social interaction. This disability is characterized. Impairments in communication, learning, and social interaction. Where are my number threes? Did you put your heads together over here? Where are my number threes? Raise your hands. Okay, over here. Um, autism. That's exactly right. Very good. That's what I was looking for. Did everyone else have that? Okay, two points over here. I think we're all tied. What Kansas legal battle, ooh, she's getting into the laws now. What Kansas legal battle determined that separate but equal education is illegal? Got to get back in the 50s for this one. <laughs> Where are my number twos? Number twos, number twos, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, we said it was uh, the Browns versus the Kansas Education. Club Brown versus the Board of Education. That's right. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, keep keep your points. <clears throat> Next question. What is the first step in changing a behavior in a student? <laughs> we talked about this one several classes because of my background especially. What is the first step in changing a behavior in a student? Put your heads together. I don't see you collaborating. <laughs> Where are my number ones? Number ones, raise your hands. Number ones. Does this group have it? Want to try it? Use your microphone. 
And is the first step identifying the behavior? Exactly, <laughs> defining the behavior. How, because how can you change your behavior if you haven't defined what it is in observable terms? Okay, ah, the behaviorist in me comes out. All right, let's try two more. <coughs> this is a true false. True or false, a teacher can diagnose a student with ADHD. Where are my number threes? False. False, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only a medical person can do that, a doctor. All right, let's try one more. Um, ah, that's a good one. NCLB, yes ma'am? Did you say identify or diagnose? Diagnose. Yeah. NCLB, which at a com I never I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, and the 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 lady who was giving the, the talk about NCLB kept referring to Nickleby. Nickleby, Nickleby. And I'm like, what is she talking about? She was talking about NCLB. I had never heard it called that before, but okay. NCLB has important implications for students with disabilities. What does N NCLB stand for? And when was it authorized? <laughs> what does NCLB stand for? And when was it authorized? I like all this co cooperative learning that's going on. Are you collaborating? It's interesting to find out they can talk. Where are my number twos? Number two? Do you have it? No? Number two over here? Use your microphone. <laughs> no Child Left Behind Act, uh, 2001. That's exactly right. 2001, No Child Left Behind. Oh, you should, you'll hear a lot about No Child Left Behind if it's still around when you start to teach. Who knows? They come and go. Let's do one more. Name two adaptations you would make in your classroom for a student with a physical disability. Two adaptations for a child with a physical disability. Let's do number threes. Who's a number three? Raise your hand. Number three over here? You're number three. Number three? Would you like to try? Use your microphone. I think it's over here. <laughs> Create open walkways and, and change this desk area. Okay. Manipulate the, the physical environment. Very good. Okay. Now, do you see how it works? This was bare bones. I can think of a lot of ways to get very creative with this that the students would really get into and be motivated and excited to cooperate and collaborate and uh, review what you want them to know. Okay? As I said, this is also a good way to see if your students are understanding or if they're remembering what you've been teaching. Because just standing up here, I could see okay, who had to look and wasn't sure and who kind of knew it right away. So as a teacher, you'll see the students who are still struggling with what you want them to know for the upcoming assessment. Okay, any questions? Have fun with this assignment. I think you'll really enjoy it. Have a good day.